Yarostan's fifth letter. Dear Sophia, Your letter arrived yesterday. Myrna and I both read it before sitting down to the supper Yara had prepared for us. Yara was annoyed. After the way she insulted you last time, I wouldn't think you'd skip supper to read another one of her letters. Myrna told Yara, It's a very moving letter, Yara. You and Sophia have a lot in common. I felt this too. For the first time since the beginning of our correspondence, I was able to recognize myself in you. This isn't only because you used my arguments, or Zedniks, in your quarrel with your friend Damon, but because your letter made me aware of similarities in our experiences and outlooks. I now feel I should apologize for the way I treated your earlier letters. I did treat you as an outsider, as a person with whom I couldn't communicate about my present situation. I was wrong. During supper last night, Myrna commented, Sophia is a born troublemaker, just like Jan and Yara. She shares Jan's recklessness as well as his courage. I'm glad for her sake that she was taken away from here, even if her emigration caused her some pain. There's no room here for people like that. If she'd stayed, she would have disappeared years ago in a prison or concentration camp. Myrna loved her reckless brother, and she's very proud of Yara's rebelliousness. Your letter convinced me that Myrna is right. If you'd stayed here, you could well have followed a path very similar to Jan's. And you're right, you certainly wouldn't have occupied the, quote, place I assigned to you in my earlier letters. The tenacity with which you pursue your struggle, even in the face of certain repression, is something you share with Jan, not with people we both consider opportunists. Your recent confrontation with the administrative psychologist at your college, your exposures of militarism during your university years, your disruption of the war expert's class, are clearly not opportunistic acts, and you make it perfectly clear to me that you couldn't have derived any privileges from engaging in those acts. You're right when you accuse me of failing to distinguish your commitment from the commitments of those around you. I did accuse you of being a carrier of the repressive functions of the university and the press, and I recognized that this accusation was unfair. I did identify your engagements with engagements that are as unacceptable to you as they are to me. I did think this because the contexts in which you've chosen to struggle are contexts in which I thought genuine rebellion impossible. In my world, the political militant, the journalist, and the academian do not and cannot help establish a human community because their very existence presupposes the absence of community. This must be true in your world, too. Tina expressed it very colorfully when, standing in the street, she shouted at Damon that his cushy job depended on the passivity of the rest of the population. You've convinced me that your engagement in Damon's activity, or in Mark Glavney and Mer Veronese's activities, doesn't make you like them, and that your engagement was, quote, some kind of affirmation of life, as you put it. But you haven't convinced me that the kind of struggle you've waged is actually possible in the context in which you fought it. Every one of your experiences convinced me that the instruments you chose are useless for the kinds of ends you tried to make them serve. You were trying to fight for liberation with the society's instruments of domination. I think this is why you always remained an outsider, while those alongside you became priests of pol political sects, missionaries of repressive religions, and officials in government bureaucracies. In my earlier letters, I failed to distinguish you from your context, and my understanding of your activities was very one-sided. You're right to emphasize the side I had excluded, and you do force me to recognize my narrow-mindedness. But I think you still leave some veils hanging. You still hide some parts of the picture. I see the picture in a new light now, but I still don't see an altogether different picture from the one I saw before. I now see that your own goals were not repressive, but I'm still convinced that the context in which you fought for those goals was repressive. In order to combat my one-sidedness, you have recourse to arguments that are equally one-sided. You pretend that the context in which you located your struggles were accidental, and that your own activities, quote, had nothing to do with those contexts. I think you're wrong. I think your activities were reduced to nothing by those contexts. I think it's no accident that the agitational activity at the carton plant 20 years ago served Vera and Mark as a stepping stone towards the establishment of bureaucratic careers. I think it's no accident that your co-worker on the university newspaper is now a functionary in the ideological establishment, nor that the students who were stimulated by the example of your journalistic activities became politicians. The context in which you sought a project and a community are institutions which thrive on the absence of what you sought, and you couldn't have been anything more than an outsider there. I'll try to clarify what I mean by telling you about my recent encounter with two of our one-time friends. Last Saturday, Yasna and I attended a lecture in the auditorium of the House of Culture. The speakers were Vera Krenna and Adrian Pavershin. Their speeches were critical exposures of the repression we've undergone during the past 20 years. 
In terms of their words alone, Vera and Adrian couldn't have been very different from you at the time when you exposed the militarization of the university on the school's newspaper staff. They sounded like rebels, even revolutionaries. But in terms of their relations to those around them, in terms of the context in which they spoke, they are not rebels, but political opportunists. I agree with you, the similarity of their activity to yours does not make you one of them. But I don't agree that the context is or can be as hospitable to your goals as to theirs. You seem convinced that speakers' platforms, newspapers, and pedagogical institutions can be serviceable to the struggle for freedom. I'm convinced of the opposite. I think such contexts are antithetical to your goals and hostile to your struggle, and by engaging in them you merely strengthen forces whose very existence negates your project and your community. Maybe I'm being unfair again. If so, I hope you'll show me where I'm wrong. I'll try to express my doubts as clearly as I can, even at the risk of being unfair and overstating my case again. If I do get carried away by my rhetoric once again, I hope you'll understand that it's not because I feel that everything you stand for is alien to me. On the contrary, I'm not addressing my comments to a stranger, but to a comrade, and it seems to me that such critical appreciation is not an expression of hostility, but is at the very basis of communication and friendship. Last Friday, Yasna walked Yara home from school and waited for me to return from work. She told me Vera and Adrian were scheduled to speak the following night, and she was quite excited about it. She hadn't seen Adrian since she'd visited him three years ago in his empty office in the trade union building. And the last time she saw Vera was 12 years ago, on the day when all three of them were arrested at Yasna House and accused of having contacts with a foreign spy. I did remember to ask Yasna if she could answer Sabina's question about the last name the police attributed to you and Luisa when they questioned her about her former acquaintances, but Yasna didn't remember the name. I didn't share any of Yasna's enthusiasm about the project of seeing Adrian and Vera. In fact, I refused to accompany her to the lecture when she first mentioned it. I told her that if two politicians ever came to the carton plant to lecture to me during work hours, I'd walk off my job, so that obviously I wasn't just supposed to go out of my way to hear the politicians. Yasna said she wasn't going because of her interest in political speeches, but because these speakers had once been her friends. If my correspondence with you hadn't revived my memories of a distant past, I doubt if I'd still remember that Adrian Pavershan and Vera Krenna had once been my friends. But I did remember this bizarre fact, and I changed my mind. Not so much because I wanted to see or hear Adrian or Vera, but because of you, because they've come to occupy such an important place in your life. The auditorium was almost empty. The audience consisted mainly of young people, probably students, although there may have been a few young workers among them. Vera Krenna was introduced first, along with all her titles. Honor honorable Rector, Honorable Member, Honorable Deputy Minister. There was little applause. She spoke very eloquently about what she called the, quote, errors which had been committed here during, quote, recent years. She was applauded when she said that those errors and shortcomings had all been brought about by the deformations of our social system. I didn't applaud, since I felt that by linking the errors to the deformations, she merely linked two equally empty words. Her concluding speech was a rousing call for what she called action. Vera's words were as out of place in the midst of the present ferment as Damon's lecture was in the midst of the student strike. Quote, we must find our way out of this vicious circle where bureaucratic attitudes reinforce passivity, and passivity reinforces bureaucratic attitudes. We must create an atmosphere favorable to the growth of initiative, the prohibition and repression of criticism, the stifling of democratic relations, only inhibit the growth of initiative. Such deformations paralyze initiative at all levels and lead to indifference and to the cult of mediocrity. We stand at a historical crossroads. We fa face a great task. The time to act has come. Let us not be satisfied with half measures. The audience applauded, and some people stood up. I felt uneasy. I had, of course, known that politicians were very busy trying to derive personal profit from the present ferment. But it is one thing to know this, and quite another to experience it directly. No one in the audience could doubt Vera's sincerity or determination. She is still a very powerful speaker, much more powerful than most of the politicians I hear on the radio in the carton plant. She is also more courageous than most of the other radical politicians of today. Perhaps she still has some of the, ch the traits that you admired her for 20 years ago. She is the first politician I've heard in recent months who referred, in one and the same speech, to the stifling of democratic relations, the repression of criticism, and the para paralysis of initiative. But like all politicians in power, Vera presents all of this as errors and deformations, not as the very nature of the system of which she's an integral part. If the system is only deformed, then it can be cured. However, if the social system is itself the deformity, then it can only be destroyed, root and branch. 
Vera's remedy follows from her own diagnosis. The system has to be cured. How? We must find. We must create. We stand. Let us. We, of course, means Vera Krenna together with her audience. Vera together with the working population. And how will we cure the system together? Obviously the same way we have always done anything together. We, the workers, will do our share by remaining at our posts in the factories, while Vera will do her share by remaining at her posts in the offices of the academic and ideological establishments. In other words, we will cure the system together by continuing to reproduce it. And why do we face this great task only now? Why have we suddenly arrived at this historic crossroads when the time to act has come? Because a ferment began at the bottom of the society, and this ferment has spread to such an extent that it threatens to sweep away all the offices that Vera and her comrades occupy. For Vera, the time has come to put an end to this ferment. That's the great task she faces. The offices she fought so hard to reach are endangered by the ferment. That's why she sounded so sincere and so determined. She's determined not to lose a single one of her conquests. Her heart may even be set on reaching new heights of bureaucratic power, on profiting from the opportunities created by the ferment itself. The present situation would then indeed be a historic crossroads for Vera Krenna. I don't think Vera is an unusually brutal, cynical, or unscrupulous person. I think the brutality is in her social activity, in the offices she occupies. These offices are part of the state apparatus. That apparatus can perform its functions only so long as a passive and submissive population lets itself be expropriated by those functions. For the past few months, thousands of people have started to perform functions they had never performed before, functions which had been the exclusive domain of the state. This is especially true in the area of communication, namely in the area which contains all of Vera Krenna's academic and ideological offices. People have started to communicate with each other directly. They've been forging their own terminologies and infusing them with their own meanings. The ideological establishment and all its means of propaganda are being superseded by human forms of communication. If this process continues, all those offices and instruments will become historical junk, curiosities discarded by a reawakened humanity. Vera's interest in derailing and stopping this ferment is not so much her own personal interest as it is the interest of an ideological establishment struggling to reimpose itself over human beings who are running out from under it. Vera Krenna, rector and ideological minister, didn't speak as an individual but as an agent of rectorship and ideology. Through her, these institutions, these abstractions, which are nothing but summaries of regularized submission, acquire a voice and a will. Through her, these abstractions assert their insatiable hunger their will to devour every human thought, word, and sound, to digest all forms of human communication and excrete them as ideology. Adrian wasn't applauded when he was introduced. Several people snickered when his full title was announced, Chairman of the Central Committee of the Commission for Problems of Standard of Living. His speech was short and dull. He did exactly what he used to do 20 years ago. He didn't add anything at all to what Vera had already said. He merely repeated a few of her platitudes and then proceeded to document them. He documented errors and deformities with statistical data. He cited facts about the stagnating rise of industrial development and the declining standard of, standard of living, facts which are well known to a population that has experienced them daily. Adrian, like Vera, called for the reproduction of the very system whose ills he documented, but he was much more straightforward about the cure than Vera. When he said, quote, the leaders must apply policies which will earn them their leading roles in society, he was hissed by several people. He apparently didn't hear the hisses because he continued in the same vein. Quote, We can no longer impose our authority, but must conquer it through our acts. The hisses became so loud that I could barely hear his concluding sentence, which was something like, quote, We can no longer impose our line by commands, but only through our work, only through the truth of our ideals. A few people applauded. Over half the audience hissed. He could not have been more pathetic if he'd begged. Please let us stay where we are. We promise to be good next time. The rulers apparently think the population is ready to overthrow them. If only the rest of the population had such an opinion of its own potential. The fact that Adrian was hissed, whereas Vera was applauded, puzzles me. I'm equally puzzled in the carton plant, where people condemn some of the radio politicians as rotten bureaucrats of the old school, while praising other politicians as people who are basically on our side. I'm puzzled because I can't see any difference between the politicians who are so different in the eyes of those around me. Either I am failing to see some very important differences, or else those around me are failing to see the similarities. This is related to something I experienced in prison. We often discussed the, be the behavior and character of prison guards, and we classified guards in terms of their de degree of brutality. 
Some guards were vicious, others so-so. A few were fairly decent. But on several occasions, I heard a prisoner refer to a guard as a person who was on our side. I could never understand this type of characterization of a prison guard. Or rather, I understood it and considered it absurd. In prison, the absurdity of such an, such an observation is made obvious by the walls, gates, and bars. A person who was not inside a cell, who policed us in the yard, who left the prison every night, was clearly not on our side. The comment was absurd if it was understood literally. But it was much more disturbing if it was not understood literally, because it described something very real about our situation as prisoners. It meant that prisoners have no side, that our fate depended completely on the wills and whims of the guards. We were things, inhuman entities without interests, desires, or potentialities. The closest we could come to regaining our humanity was to have our interests and desires represented among the guards. Saying that a guard was on our side meant that all that remained of our humanity was lodged in the guard. The applause given to politicians like Vera Krenna in the present situation is even more disturbing than it would have been in prison. Our survival as human beings in prison did in fact depend on the prison guards, on the presence or absence of our side among the guards. Every attempt to affirm our humanity on our own led directly to severe repression, mutilation, even death. But this isn't the case in our present situation, a situation Vera described as a historical crossroads. For the first time in 20 years, the extent of our development as human beings has not depended on the extent to which our humanity was represented among the prison guards, the ruling politicians. For the first time in 20 years, we've begun to take steps to regain our own potentialities and realize our own desires. For the first time in 20 years, we haven't been prisoners at the mercy of guards, but free human beings discovering our freedom and beginning to forge our own humanity. The applause given to politicians like Vera indicates that many, disturbingly many people, are not able to leave the prison in which they've been locked up. It means that many of my contemporaries are unable to accept the reality of their own desires, even in the act of realizing them. They are unable to accept themselves as human beings. They've been locked up too long. They can no longer imagine any freedom other than the freedom of the prison guard. They've repressed all desires except those represented among the guards. Even while they take steps to realize their own project, they affirm a politician's project and deny their own. Most of the audience left after Adrian's speech. A group of people gathered around Vera and a smaller group around Adrian. Yasna told me she wanted to talk to Adrian, or at least to shake his hand. She told me she felt sorry for him. I stayed in my seat when she walked up to the circle of people surrounding Adrian. He was very busy, grinning and shaking hands. He didn't seem aware that anyone had hissed his speech. The enthusiasts surrounding him probably gave him the impression that everyone in the audience considered him a seer. Most of Adrian's admirers were gone when he noticed Yasna. He shook her hand as if he were pumping water from a well. She must have asked if he remembered me, because both turned to look at me. Adrian's face didn't show the slightest sign of recognition. He immediately turned to the young man next to Yasna and started pumping his hand. Yasna's turn had ended. Yasna walked towards the large group which still surrounded Vera and waited. I saw Vera look at Yasna several times and then turn to someone else. Yasna waited until she and a girl who couldn't have been over 12 were the only people who still wanted to shake Vera's hand. Vera shook Yasna's hand without even looking at her, said, Thank you very much, comrades, shook the girl's hand, and turned back to Adrian, saying, Well, that didn't go over as badly as I thought it would. Yasna walked towards me with tears in her eyes. Adrian at least remembered my name, she sobbed. When we left the auditorium, she was crying. Vera lived with me for five years. We could have been sisters. She doesn't even know who I am. I tried to console Yasna by telling her that I wouldn't have recognized either Vera or Adrian if I hadn't been reminded of them by our recent conversations and by your letters. You haven't seen them for 20 years, and you never knew them the way I did, Yasna said, and continued to cry. She knew that it wasn't only time that separated her from her former housemates. The distance between two worlds separated her from them. Yasna was as alien to Vera and Adrian as you were to Ron on the night of your last encounter with him. When Ron said, I hear you're going to college, you heard him ask, when did I ever have anything to do with you? Adrian remembered only Yasna's name. Vera didn't remember that she'd ever had anything to do with Yasna, not only because 12 years have turned Yasna into a stranger, but also because Yasna's world is strange to Vera. The people who inhabit Vera's world have names, real names, like chairman, first secretary, or president. They have titles, posts, offices. They're the people Vera remembers. Yasna doesn't have a title. She doesn't have a name. Yasna isn't somebody. She's nobody. Yasna is a cipher in the population statistics, a grain of sand indistingu indistinguishable from all other grains on a beach, 
a face indistinguishable from all other faces in an audience. She's merely another hand to shake after a speech, another member of the working class whose noble cause Vera serves. Yasna and I walked silently towards my house. I stopped trying to console her. I thought of your first two letters. I understood perfectly why I had responded to them so unfairly. You had described these politicians as your community, as the only people you knew who weren't puppets, as insurgents who had struggled to shake off their own chains without enslaving others. I had responded as if you told me you had modeled your life on the life of the Roman Emperor Caligula. I hadn't seen Vera or Adrian for 20 years, and I had never exerted the type of social power they aspired to. I've never seen Caligula either, nor have I occupied any post comparable to his. But I've experienced some of the effects of the project of their likes. When you identified yourself with them, I thought of you as one of them. I'm now convinced that you're not one of them, that your project has nothing in common with theirs. But the terrain on which you've chosen to struggle for your project is their terrain. Every one of the activities you've described is an activity of politicians and ideologues. This is what led me to respond so unfairly. I couldn't imagine that anything human could grow on that terrain, and I still can't. During our walk home, I could have tried to cheer Jasna up by telling her she ought to be flattered not to be recognized as a comrade by two opportunistic politicians, but I didn't think of this. Yet, this is what Myrna must have had in mind when we got home and she saw Yasna's tears. She asked us what had happened. They didn't recognize us, I said. Did you think those people would recognize you? Myrna asked. How important do you think you are? Yasna smiled in response to Myrna's question, but protested. I'm as much of a person as they are. Maybe you are in Yarostan's eyes, and in my eyes, Myrna said. At my factory, there are dozens like me in my section, and there's one manager. Do you think I'm as important as he is? Much more important, I said. Myrna laughed and said, Come with me on Monday morning and tell him that. Yasna laughed too. At this point, Yara turned to Yasna and asked, Could you tell if they were lovers? Yara had apparently been bursting to ask this question from the moment we had entered the house, but had been inhibited by Yasna's sadness. Could I tell what? Yasna asked. Krenna and Pavershan, are they lovers? Yara asked. What in the world do you know about that? I asked her. Yasna told us all about them, Vera insisted. What Yasna told us was that Vera married the bank director, and when Adrian was released from prison and found that, found that out, he stayed away from Vera, I reminded her. Yasna also told us Pavershan went out with the rector's secretary, y Yara reminded me. I told my girlfriend Julia everything Yasna told us. Julia's father works in the state bank and knows all about the bank director and his wife. Julia says they talk about them all the time, but they don't know anything about Pavershan. Julia told me the bank director is old and his wife isn't nearly as old. In their mansion, they sleep in separate rooms. Did your girlfriend's father tell you about all that, I asked? No, Julia figured it out, Yara said. You mean she made it up, I said. She did not, Yara snapped back angrily. She's not a liar, I said. I'm sorry, I was amazed that you and your friends discussed such things. Why shouldn't we? You do, Yara retorted. Myrna laughed and said, We keep forgetting that you're already 11 years old. I asked Yara to tell us what Julia had figured out. Her father had talked about Deputy Minister Krenna having a lover, but no one knew who he was until I told Julia about Pavershan. I burst out laughing and couldn't keep myself from asking, Do you actually know what a lover is? Do you want me to bring mine home and show you? His name's Slobodan, Yara snapped. Yasna and I were embarrassed. Myrna laughed. Unfortunately, not one of us can take credit for Yara's sophistication. Periods of ferment undoubtedly have a stimulating effect on everyone. I begged Yara to go on. Julia's father only knew that Krenna's lover was some kind of official, that he was married, and that Krenna had him appointed to a commission, Yara continued. But it was Julia who put all the pieces together. She's read stories like that in magazines, but usually it's the women who does what Paversham did. She knew from the papers that every time he and Krenna gave a speech together, that he got another promotion until he became commission chairman. When I told her what Yasna told us, Julia figured out that Paversham had never stopped loving Krenna, even though he hated her for what she's done to him but he knew Krenna would throw him out if he simply showed up in her office. She'd think he wanted to get even with her. So he married her secretary, the one Yasna told us about. That way, when he turned up at the rector's office, he wouldn't be looking for Krenna, but for his wife. And it would be Krenna who would accidentally run into him. Can you imagine her expression when she asks, Are you looking for me? And he answers, No, I'm waiting for my wife. Julia figured out something else, too. Krenna would have thrown him out of her office if he turned up there unmarried. But she must have turned green with envy when she learned that he was married to her secretary. Julia says it really doesn't matter if he planned all this from the start, or if he married Krenna's secretary because he actually loved her. In either case, he obviously ran into Krenna, since they're together now, 
and his wife is Krenna's private secretary. Julia's father said it was Krenna who appointed him, and Yasna told us he was someone who'd do anything for an appointment. Don't you see? Krenna appointed him, and then he had to see her about his post, sometimes at night, sometimes even all night. Krenna was tired of that old bank director. When they started giving speeches, they were together all the time. We were stunned. I had no reason to doubt the plausibility of any part of Yara's story. After a long pause, I asked, How old is your girlfriend, Julia? She's ten and a half, Yara answered. Then, by way of explanation, she added, But we're both in the same grade in school. I was stunned by the worldly wisdom of Yara and her ten-year-old girlfriend. I was also disturbed. What bothered me was related to what had bothered me in your letters, and also to what had bothered me when young people had applauded Vera Krenna's lecture. What disturbs me is not Yara's sophistication, but her frame of reference. She and her friend have unbelievable insight into the private lives of the ruling bureaucrats. They're familiar with the most intimate details of a world that's completely alien to them. They're as interested in the love affairs of officials as the ancient Greeks were in the love affairs of their gods. The world of officials is the world that matters. Officials are today's gods. They're omnipotent and immortal. Not as individuals. Krenna and Pavarsham are mortal. They're also replaceable. The deputy minister and the chairman are neither mortal nor replaceable. They're the essential beings, the permanence behind the flux, the fixed stars of an ever-changing universe. They're immortal. They can conceivably be dislodged from their positions, but only through a cosmic cat cataclysm which takes place in the sky. They cannot be dislodged by mere mortals. Nothing we do down here affects them. The project which Yara has already forged with her companions has not dislodged the all-powerful beings who inhabit her imagination. The solidarity, the community, the potentiality she and her likes experienced in their demonstrations are transitory and trivial compared to the love affairs of a deputy minister and a chairman. Yara's acts may at times be courageous and exciting, but they can never be fascinating, admirable, or awesome. Fascination, admiration, and awe are reserved for the acts of the gods. Like those of my fellow workers in the plant who applaud the speeches of certain bureaucrats, Yara is already a fascinated admirer. Like them, she has already experienced in herself a capacity, however modest, to overthrow the ruling relations, and like them, she lodges all capacity in the gods. Like them, she has already experienced a glimmer of freedom, yet she still can't imagine any freedom other than the freedom of a prison guard. Yara and her friend are our contemporaries, not only because of the sophistication of their perceptions, but also because they're already prisoners of the ruling ideology. Like the students who applauded Vera Krenna's speech, Yara and her friend remain locked up within this ideology at a time when their own acts are undermining the ideology's so social foundations. With half of their being, they dig the grave for the expiring corpse of the repressive world, while with the other half, they infuse the corpse with new life and carry it through yet another crisis. In one of your earlier letters, you and Louisa argued very eloquently that slaves are not responsible for their misery, nor workers for their exploitation, nor the poor for their poverty, nor prisoners for their imprisonment. That's true, but only superficially. Where do masters derive their mastery? From the stars? Where do the rich get their wealth, if not from the poor? Where do guards and exploiters derive their power? You and Louisa are right in a very narrow sense. We don't shoot ourselves. They shoot us. But it's we who produce them. It's we who staff their armies. It's we who produce the weapons that kill us. It isn't even true that they shoot us. They only order us shot, and it's we who implement their orders. We butcher ourselves. I'm not suggesting that Yara's imagination has been permanently maimed. If this were so, she wouldn't have been able to engage in the demonstrations in which she's been taking such an active part. All the lively activities taking place around me prove that no one has been permanently maimed. Human beings cannot be permanently transformed into insects or robots. But all the half-revolutions of the past show that human beings are as reluctant to reclaim the totality of their repressed humanity as they are to lose it. I think you illustrate this as much as Yara and my fellow workers in the carton plant. I'm not talking about opportunism now. I finally do recognize that you have nothing in common with Vera Krenna. I'm talking about an ambiguity you share with people who are genuine rebels. I'm talking about the fact that you've reproduced the official project in the very act of struggling to realize your own. You've reenacted repressive relations in the very act of fighting against them. The world in which you've tried to realize yourself is the world Yara carries in her head. It is the official world, the world of officials. The context in which you've chosen to fight your struggle makes your acts ambiguous. It robs your acts of their intentions and turns them against you. You haven't been uncritical of the environment in which you sought to realize your projects. In fact, some of your critiques of the academic world are devastating, and they've been very instructive and novel to me because I know so little about it. 
Yet how am I to understand your critiques if you conclude every one of them by telling me that this was the world in which you sought your project and your community? Would you understand someone who gave a lucid analysis of the social function of the police and concluded by telling you that he had joined the police in order to struggle against its social function? I won't say that this situation is identical to yours, but there are similarities. The social function of the bureaucratized education and communication is not identical to the function of the police, but the two functions are not mutually exclusive and their consequences are terribly similar. A prisoner whose helplessness leads him to seek out guards who are on our side is terribly similar to the worker who thinks a politician is on our side. The prisoner's justification is that the guards are armed. The prisoner's human prospects do in fact reside in the guard. But a worker who thinks his human projects reside in a politician is deluded. He is imprisoned, not by concrete walls and iron bars, but by delusions implanted in his mind. The schools, the newspapers, the official and unofficial propaganda machines, the proclamations of the rulers, and the consciousness-raising campaigns of, quote, revolutionaries, are the instruments which create these delusions. They are the walls and bars which imprison him. You've told me in your activities you didn't aim to implant the ruling delusions, but to undermine them. You've convinced me about the integrity of your intentions, but you're not as lucid about your own intentions as you are about Damon's. As soon as he began talking about his intention to found a newspaper in which the inherently revolutionary workers would, quote, speak for themselves, you spotted the saint, the prophet, the shepherd, and guide lurking behind the intentions. You're not nearly as lucid about yourself. Surrounded by prophets, politicians, and aspiring bureaucrats, you fought for your own project on a terrain where only theirs could grow. You fought against repression within the repressive apparatus itself. You don't claim to have realized any of your own goals in that context, but you claim that it was not your intention to contribute to the realization of their goals. Are you sure you didn't in fact strengthen their goals, the apparatus's goals, by your mere presence within it? Did your intentions really matter? It's not Vera's intentions that make her a bureaucrat, but her social activity. Her intentions are to, quote, find a way out of our bureaucratic attitudes and to, quote, create an atmosphere favorable to the growth of initiative. In terms of her intentions, Vera is probably still a very devoted revolutionary, the humorous and quick-witted militant you remember. I'm sure that in her own eyes she's devoted, not to herself, but to the worker's cause, not, the, not to the repressive apparatus, but to society's liberation from it. But in her daily life, she's an integral part of the repressive apparatus, and she's determined to remain within it. The bridge between her intentions and her practice is the ideology which allows her to equate her own success with the success of the workers. I'm sure Vera is convinced that the higher she rises in the bureaucratic apparatus, the closer we all are to finding our way out of bureaucratic attitudes. And the greater the power she and her friends are able to exercise over the rest of society, the more favorable the atmosphere becomes for the growth of initiative. She identifies her importance in the repressive apparatus with the worker's cause and her freedom to exercise repressive powers with society's liberation from repression. If this repressive ideology were confined to Vera Krenna, she could be dismissed as a very cynical and profoundly deluded individual, and the rest of us could then turn to life's real problems. But Vera's delusions are not confined to Vera and Adrian. They're shared to some extent by all of us, even by people who can't use these delusions as masks for their own private ambitions. Vera's applauding audiences share her delusions. People with whom I work share them. Yara shares them. You share them. When we shut down the carton plant in order to oust the union functionary, we began to find our way out of the bureaucratic society and to create an atmosphere favorable to our own growth and our own freedom. But when we praise the speech of a radio politician, we back away from our own deed and return to the safe terrain of the official delusion, the delusion that we can't find our own way. We revert to the comforting conviction that our growth and our freedom are being realized by one another politician. And, like Vera Krena and her likes, we identify our own growth and freedom with the advancement and power of politicians who are on our side. We give up our own struggle and become passive admirers and supporters of our bureaucrat. We renounce our projects and our potentialities and lodge them in our representatives who realize them for us. The programs and commitments of Krenna and Pavarshan are nothing but veils which cover their own private goals. Theories of liberation are the clothes of dictators. Vera Krenna finds our way out of bureaucratic attitudes by marrying the head of the state bank, by using his influence to imprison the university rector, by replacing the former rector, by rising to the post of deputy minister of the ideological commission. Vera Krenna serves the cause of the workers by reviving her love affair with Adrian Pavarsham, by promoting Pavarsham to member and then chairman. And we sit by our radios and newspapers, admiring the progress of our struggles and the flowering of our humanity during the official daily sessions and the unofficial nightly sessions. Our projects and our freedom become mere concepts. 
The reality behind the concepts consists of the love affairs of the deputy minister and the chairman of the Commission of Problems of Standard of Living. Our struggle is played out in the corridors of government palaces and the bedrooms of country houses. We identify our lives with the private lives of bureaucrats because our own lives have stopped being real to us. We have no projects. Only the rulers have projects. If we nevertheless want projects, we think we can have them only in the world of the all-powerful all bureaucrats, not in the world we share with others like us. Thus we seek to realize ourselves by negating ourselves. We seek to express ourselves not directly, not as individuals, but indirectly, as voices magnified a thousandfold by electronic instruments. We seek to communicate, not within the community of our likes, but within the community of written words, the community of newspapers, books, and leaflets. But in that community there is no communication because that's not a human community, and we either accept our bureaucratic assignments or we're evicted as outsiders. I believe you fought bravely in the university and on the newspaper staffs, but I don't believe you took any steps toward the realization of your projects because I don't believe such steps can be taken in that world. From our vantage point in repressive societies, it's as hard to imagine a world without newspapers as it is to imagine a community of free human beings. But if your whole life has been in search of such a community, how could you possibly have thought you'd find it on a newspaper staff? A community of free human beings is, first of all, a community in which every individual defines reality. And it is on this basis that the community builds its own environment. Journalism can only exist where there are no free human beings, where there is no community. The person who specializes in informing others about the news is a usurper. The newspaper establishes a reality which is common to all but alien to each, a reality expressed by all which is the self-expression of none. By letting the news be defined for us, we allow our definition of reality to be imposed on us from outside ourselves, and we lose our ability to define, express, or project ourselves. We lose precisely those faculties that made us communica communicative and communal animals, the faculties that make us human beings. You treat your exclusion from the university newspaper and from the oppositional newspaper as an exclusion from utopia, and you describe your trip to Sabina's garage as a descent to the underworld. In the newspaper world, you saw yourself as a participant, but in Sabina's world, you saw yourself as a disoriented tourist. Yet the garage in which Sabina and her friends lived is an environment far more familiar to me than the world of the university or the newspaper. Your descent to Sabina's world is a, is a descent to my world. I recognize the people as well as the activities. Those are the people with whom I shared cells during both prison terms. Those are the activities and the choices I confronted when I was released from prison. Those are the activities in which most of the people I've known have engaged. I hope you're beginning to understand why I treated your previous letters as the letters of a stranger. You describe my world as a world which is far stranger, far more exotic to you than your world ever was to me. Nevertheless, you did descend from the world of the newspaper, even if not by your own choice. The moments during which you considered your alternatives in the world below the propaganda apparatus must have been very much like the days I spent facing similar alternatives after my first release. As soon as you start moving in an environment very much like my own, I understand you and I admire you. I think Myrna was right when she compared your courage, as well as your recklessness, to Jan's. You refused to become a protected daughter or a protected wife. You refused to sell your labor for a wage. You left yourself no other choice but to descend, yet further, to a place you call the underworld. And once there, you refused to submit to the requirements for survival imposed by that world. You refused to sit inside a display window waiting to be bought. I'm obviously very interested in learning what you did do in the garage operated by Sabina and her friends. When you wrote about your search for genuine friends and for a human community in, a, in the world of academics and journalists, I responded with hostility, and I didn't understand your search. But when you carry that search into the world of Tissy, Jose, and Sabina, I suddenly understand. That's why I'd like to know what you did in Sabina's world. Why you and Sabina both left it. Why your only friend today is the pedagogue, Damon. It seems to me that your search is transformed as soon as you leave the academic world and descend to the underworld. Looking for community in the world of academics is like looking for trust among informers or for sympathy among executioners. In that world, it's impossible to distinguish the desire for self-realization as a human being from the desire for self-realization as a bureaucrat. It's only when you descend among those who are nothing in the society that your search becomes meaningful as a struggle against the society. Tissy, Jose, Ted are nothing. In order to become anything at all, they have to become everything all at once. And that can only happen through the complete destruction of the society. For them, there are neither transitional stages nor illusory victories along the way to self-realization. 
To look for a human community among them is to look for the destruction of everything that makes them and their likes an underworld. I think I share your lifelong commitment, but I also think you don't grasp the nature of that commitment. You still refer to our experience in the carton plant 20 years ago as the original stimulus for your commitment. I think the project and community you seek were as absent from that experience as they were from all your subsequent experiences. I think that experience played an altogether different role in your life than the mo from the one you attribute to it. I think your attachment to that experience stems from a desire to materialize your dreams, a desire to visualize what cannot be visualized, a desire to resurrect what can only be created. I share your commitment, if it's a commitment, not to a corpse, but to a community that has never existed, a community that cannot coexist with the world that represses it. But I don't share your understanding of that commitment. By locating its source in a repressive experience, you make the goal itself repressive. Yet I also understand your desire to resurrect the past. You're not unique in having such desires. When I was first released from prison, I wanted to relive the very experiences you've placed at the center of your life. Louisa's life has revolved around the revolution she experienced before she came here. Every politician seems to be motivated by the dream of stepping into the shoes of a past prophet, dictator, or executioner. Nor is this desire to resurrect the past confined to priests and politicians. It's probably shared by all individuals who have desires. I think it's related to your commitment, but very differently from the way you say it is. After my first release from prison, I would probably have expressed myself in terms very similar to yours. I didn't only feel hostile towards the police society into which I had been released, I also felt that I had lost something. That something was missing. Something I had learned to want. Like you, I thought that this missing element was something I had possessed sometime in the past, perhaps during the agitation of the carton plant, or during the resistance, or perhaps only when I had listened to Louisa's accounts of the revolution she's, she had experienced. I was convinced that I had been whole and alive in the past, and I wanted to be whole and alive again. I wanted to resurrect the past situation. If my memory isn't exaggerating, I think I was at the time convinced that anyone who had experienced such a community and wanted to resurrect it was an insurgent, my comrade and my like. I sensed that Myrna had a similar dream and a similar commitment. I thought she too had lost a community, and that she too was committed to resurrecting her lost community. I idealized the village where she spent her first six years of her life. I imagined that she had lost the rebirth of plant life in springtime, the summer walks in the countryside, the chores as well as the festivals, the wood burning during the long winter. Above all, I thought she had lost a world of human beings, each of whom had recognized the other's humanity. The war and the occupation had driven the Sedlaks out of that community. They had tried to resurrect the village environment on the fringes of this bureaucratic city. Myrna seemed awkward and out of place. I interpreted her awkwardness as a form of resistance to the environment to which she'd been brought as a form of affirmation of the community she'd been forced to abandon. I saw Myrna as a patient, but committed insurgent, determined not to lose forever the communal relationships she had once experienced. I understood Myrna's life the same way I understood my own, the same way you still understand yours. I thought all her gestures, including her attachment to me, were motivated by a search similar to mine, a search for something lost, for something missing, for something she had learned to want. I was wrong about Myrna, as I was about myself. And I'm convinced you're just as wrong about yourself. The community I thought Myrna had lost was a product of my imagination. Her actual village was no more of a community than the neighborhood into which her family settled on the outskirts of the city. Later on, Myrna told me that when she'd still lived in her village, she dreamed only of moving to the city. And once in the city, she'd never dreamed of returning to the village. I don't know if a genuine community ever existed in a peasant village. I doubt it. Even if it did, this community disintegrated so long ago that our memories couldn't possibly retain any trace of it. Myrna's village, like all other villages that survive today, was a food factory. Its inhabitants were commodity producers. Its project was the production and sale of merchandise. I idealized Myrna's village for the same reason that I idealized my own past experience, because it was the past. Since that past experience existed only in my memory, I continually infused it with present desires until it grew into a golden age, a utopia that contained everything my present lacked. I think this is what you've done with your experience in the carton plant. You've made it your utopia. You've convinced yourself that it had contained people, relations, and projects you haven't been able to find since. But by doing this, we turned our heads backward while we continued to walk forward. My understanding of Myrna wasn't only wrong, it was inverted. Myrna herself, unlike you and me, never looked for her future in her past. She wasn't self-satisfied, like the numerous complacent patriots whom neither you nor I seem to include among our acquaintances. She wasn't submissive, like her mother, who accepted whatever happened as the inevitable unwinding of fate, 
Nor was she an opportunist, like those of our friends who waited for a buyer to offer them a future in exchange for their lives. Myrna's life, like yours and mine, was motivated by a search. But it wasn't a search for something she had lost. If something was missing in her urban world, it wasn't something that had existed in her village. Whatever was missing in her present had already been missing in her past. What she felt in the city was not nostalgia for the village, but relief at having left it. Near the end of your letter, you say that for me, quote, it's so clear and obvious where the opportunism lies. I only, I only wish it were clear and obvious. To me, it's only clear and obvious that during most of the time I've spent out of prison, I've collaborated in the reproduction of the repressive apparatus. To me, it's clear and obvious that whatever it was Myrna sought, she has only moved further away from it. It's not so clear where the opportunism lies. We've sold our lives in order to survive. In this respect, we don't differ from Vera, Adrian, or Mark Labney. They were once rebels, too, like you and me. They, too, were motivated by a search for something missing. They, too, felt desires and were oppressed by the ruling society. But unlike Myrna, you and me, they didn't sell only their lives in order to survive. They also sold their desires. They weren't unwilling collaborators in the reproduction of the repressive apparatus, but became its carriers and its functionaries. They appropriated its desire, the desire to contain, repress, and extinguish the humanity of each. The extension of their initial goal became their project. They realized themselves within the apparatus that makes self-realization impossible. Vera, Mark, Adrian, and Claude are on the upper levels of a pyramid, while we're at its base. We've wanted and we've tried to overthrow the pyramid, yet we've been among those who supported it. We did it in order to survive. We were opportunists to that extent. We sold our humanity in order to keep it. By selling it, we lost it. We merely added to the weight that crushed us. By surviving, we kept alive not our humanity, but at least its potential. And by keeping alive that potential, that nothing which can at any moment become something, we've kept alive a flame that can at any moment set a fire to the entire bureaucratic pyramid we call society. I think an opportunist is an individual who extinguishes that flame, and I think what you call your search for a community is the struggle to keep that potential alive. When Myrna and I were married, we confirmed the reality of our desires because we found them in each other. Both of us expected the future to be nothing like the present or the past, and each of us thought this future was guaranteed by the other. We were both wrong. After our marriage, the world remained the same, the only change was that I replaced her brother in her parents' house. We continued to live on the outskirts of the city, and urban worker though I was, I drove a bus, just like her father. Myrna's enthusiasm, her lust for life, adventure, and change were frustrated. She talked less. Our walks grew shorter. She didn't tell me she was unhappy. She didn't even hint that she wanted to leave her parents' house. Not that I was observant enough to understand a hint. I was too busy proselytizing, telling her about Luisa's experiences. She made me feel self-conscious, just as Jan did whenever he came to visit. I talked, and I remained where I was. I even talked about driving that wretched bus, and I continued to drive it. It was Jan who finally put an end to a situation that couldn't have gone on much longer. He asked if I'd be willing to work in a vehicle repair depot where he worked, at the opposite end of the city. The possibility of working with Jan appealed to me, but I didn't like the idea of spending two hours a day traveling on a bus in addition to eight hours at the depot. You could get an apartment, Jan suggested. Myrna would welcome the change. I obviously didn't go to the depot to apply for the job. Such a procedure is archaic under the dictatorship of the proletariat. I don't really know if anyone gets a job that way anymore. I got my second job the way I've gotten the bus driving job. Jan went to the trade union building next door to the depot, spoke to Titus Zebran, and Titus pulled some strings. An official pulled strings. And some workers I've met thought they'd won a victory 20 years ago. I didn't even have to go to Titus's office the second time. Jan went alone. He told me Titus picked up the phone, listed the qualifications of the mechanic, Muran Sedlak, and told Yan that I would start working in the depot the following Monday. I suppose everyone must know someone like Titus Abram. I wonder what happens to people who don't. This was the third time he had pulled me out of a trap, and it wasn't the last. What gave Titus Abram the power to pull strings? My powerlessness. If I had picked up the telephone and introduced myself as Yaristan or Miran, the person at the other end would have laughed and said, Comrade, if you're not an official, you can't be heard. This is a people's democracy. For several weeks, I actually enjoyed my new job. I had repaired presses in the carton plant, but I had never dismantled a vehicle. I was impressed by the ingenuity of the generations of workmen who had connected the power of an engine to the motion of axles and wheels without concerning themselves about the use to which their work would be put. Would they have worked so hard if they had known what their work was for, or didn't they care? After the first few weeks, the work became familiar and then routine. My initial awe gave way to resentment toward the tinkerers 
who had given their lives to the project of transporting ever larger quantities of commodities with even greater speed. Working alongside Jan, I couldn't forget what my work was for, because he continually reminded me. Once, when I was still new on the job, I went on working on an engine when the others took a smoking break. Jan grabbed my wrench and asked, What's your hurry, brother? If the buses pile up, some people won't be able to get to work, and they'll have the day off. He didn't let any of us forget that the buses didn't serve our aims, but only the managers, the bureaucracies, the state's aims, and that the faster we worked, the more we increased the power of the forces that policed us. Jan didn't let any of us forget that those vehicles were not our project. It was during those first few weeks on my new job, when Myrna and I still lived in her parents' house, that I stopped trying to convert my host to the wisdom I had learned from Louisa. I finally gave up the project I had embraced so enthusiastically when I'd first visited the Sedlaks, the project of going to the people with news about a past experience. It wasn't only Jan's hostility toward my missionary activity that made me give it up, but also my own growling hostility towards it. I became ridiculous to myself. My situation, my daily activity, made me sense that my closely reasoned arguments were incoherent, contradictory, and irrational. I spent an hour every morning and another every evening on a crowded bus, usually standing, letting myself be conveyed to and from a garage where I repaired buses. Some of my fellow passengers rode to factories where they produced the tools or the parts with which I repaired the buses. I spent all the motion of my limbs tightening chains that bound us to a monster. Yet every evening I spoke to my hosts about a community of free human beings. I had learned about such a community from Louisa. One of my favorite stories had to do with workers who drove and repaired buses. I told it to the Sedlaks as enthusiastically as Louisa had told it to me. Bus drivers and repairmen like I, Jan, and his father had once turned against the monster. They had taken over the entire transportation network of their city. Like a schoolboy reciting a memorized lesson, I stressed the fact that shortly after the takeover, the buses were again running on schedule. They were again transporting workers to factories and buyers to markets. They were again repaired. The workers themselves were doing without capitalists and managers exactly what they had done with capitalists and managers. In other words, with naive enthusiasm, I told my hosts over and over again that workers had defeated the monster and yet remained chained to it. My hosts didn't respond. They evidently didn't understand why I was so enthusiastic, and they obviously didn't think that such a victory was worth a drop of workers' blood. Let your friend Damon call me an intellectual. I was educated and informed by Louisa, if by no one else. Because of this education, I had to think hard in order to figure out what was perfectly obvious to Jan and his father. Who but workers have ever driven and repaired buses? Who but workers have ever transported other workers to and from factories? If those workers fought on barricades in order to do voluntarily what they'd been forced to do before, then there was something wrong with those workers, or else with Louisa's story. But my hosts were polite. They didn't ask me if I'd be willing to risk my life in order to drive a bus, quote, on my own. They'd heard such meaningless jargon before, on the radio. They still had high hopes for me. But I lost my missionary zeal, as well as my self-assurance, and grew increasingly depressed. Everything I knew was false, and everything I did was harmful. On balance, it was my activity that bothered me more than my ignorance, because I spent only an hour a day talking compared to the ten I spent working and traveling. You're perfectly right. Survival or not, there's only one word for that activity. It's prostitution. From morning to night, I sold myself. I exchanged my life for a sum of money. What I knew or thought I knew was completely irrelevant. I sold myself when I was a missionary, and I continued selling myself after I stopped being a missionary. The only concrete thing I did with my life was to keep some buses running, to contribute to the efficient circulation of commodities and labor power. The hopes Myrna and I had shared vanished like childhood illusions about the adult world. While I became increasingly depressed, Myrna grew more hopeful. Vesna was born shortly before I got my new job, and to Myrna the birth of the child and my job transfer were the first of a series of changes that were going to transform our lives. My job transfer confirmed some of her more extravagant expectations. One day, after I complained bitterly about the social function of my new job, she said, Don't be such a pessimist. That's only a beginning. A beginning of what? I didn't ask her, but I think I knew. It was the beginning of our journey from the village to an imaginary place where all desires could be fulfilled. In her eyes, I had apparently stepped backward into the village when I had become a bus driver like her father. The move to her brother's job was a move out of the village. Jan lived by himself in the city. He didn't grow chickens or potatoes in his own backyard. He was no longer a peasant, but a worker. And the fact that I moved at all confirmed her most profound hope. It confirmed that I was able to move. But it was only after I had been on my new job for several weeks, after I asked her if she wanted to move closer to the center of the city, that Myrna expressed any of this. An apartment in the city, she exclaimed. 
If you only knew how long I've dreamed of that and how I've been afraid that I'd never get there. Of course I want an apartment in the city. There's no reason for Vesna to be brought up by my mother when she's already so close to a different kind of life. How badly I've wanted to leave Yaristan. I hate it here. Didn't you know? If I hadn't known, I knew then. It was becoming clear to me why my new job was a beginning. It was the beginning of Myrna's final break with the village, the beginning of Myrna's journey to the dream world she had seen from far away, the beginning of Vesna's upbringing as an urban worker, a citizen, someone like Jan and Sabina, the beginning of a different kind of life. Since neither of us had to be convinced, our next problem was to find an apartment. Various monuments were built after the war to celebrate the workers' victory, but very little had been done to house the victorious workers. The consciousness of the working class had to be housed first, and all the new buildings were inhabited almost exclusively by bureaucrats. I could have turned to Titus Zebron once again, but I had misgivings about the strings he had already pulled for me. I decided to consult the people with whom I worked in the depot. That was how Yan found his place. A worker offered to share his apartment with Yan. But since there were three of us, this possibility was out of the question. My fellow workers promised to keep their eyes open for any vacancies that might turn up in their neighborhoods. But weeks passed, and then months. Myrna grew impatient. She decided to look on her own. She visited addresses advertised in the newspaper. They were all privately owned houses or apartments. Her experience was the same wherever she went. She was asked what her husband did, and as soon as she said mechanic, she was told the apartment was already rented. She cried as soon as she got home. After four or five days, she gave up. Finally, several months after our search began, one of the workers at the depot told me there was a vacancy in the building across the street from where he lived. I went to see the place as soon as I got off work. The building was an ancient, two-story mansion that had been di divided up and turned into an apartment house already before the war. After the coup, the four downstairs and four upstairs apartments were classified as doubles, so that the one-time single private house now consisted of 16 living units. Each double unit consisted of two bedrooms and a single living room, bathroom, and kitchen. In other words, the vacant apartment consisted of a vacant bedroom. An old worker who had occupied it had just died. When I described the place to Myrna, she was overjoyed. She was so frustrated and so desperate that she'd gladly have run to a rat-infested basement that had been used to store coal. All that mattered was that there were neither geese nor chickens in the yard and that all the neighbors got their potatoes and vegetables from stores. She didn't even want to see the place first. We simply moved in, and all her enthusiasm returned. Myrna greeted and embraced our new neighbors as if they were long-lost friends. She carried Vesna around the neighborhood, in and out of all the stores, as if to familiarize the baby with her new, genuinely urban surroundings. In the evenings, we took long walks. Myrna studied all the passers-by, their expressions, as well as their clothes. She also studied all the commodities displayed in the store windows. Myrna fulfilled her life's dream. She became a city dweller, a citizen, the wife of a city worker, with an apartment of her own and a child who would be no more of a country bumpkin than her urban neighbors or her brother. But that school-created dream masked a shallow reality. She became everything she was going to become on the day she moved out of her parents' house. The following day, or week, or month, she didn't become more of a citizen or more of a worker's wife. She didn't become more creative, nor more imaginative, nor, after her enthusiasm dissipated, more energetic. She didn't become anything she hadn't been before. She merely lost her life's dream. But that dream is a chameleon. It changes whenever we think we've reached it. Myrna knew that something had gone wrong, that something was still missing. I remember one of the statements she made only a few weeks after we moved. Quote, I had expected everything to be so different. She had expected a new life. She had expected what you express with the words project and community. But she didn't become desperate or depressed. She still experienced reality as she'd been taught to experience it. She held on to her dream. The chameleon transformed itself. Whatever was still missing, whatever she hadn't become, could be bought in a store. She didn't buy very much. We had saved a considerable sum of money during the year when I had driven the bus, and we had lived in Eaton at her parents' house. She spent very little of it. She's always been afraid to spend money. But the few things she did buy were very important to her. Since our room was adequately furnished, we didn't need to buy furniture. But we did need curtains. I'm sure that no city has ever been built with the love and care with which she bought those curtains. She looked at shop windows for several weeks. Every night we walked to look at another pair. When she finally bought them, she treated them as a second newborn child. After the curtains were hung, she repeated the entire ceremony with a bedspread. Yasna read novels in order to experience in fiction what she'd failed to experience in her life. Myrna bought curtains and a bedspread. The objects replaced her project as well as her community. 
But like the apartment itself, the objects lost their promise on the day they were acquired. No new life began. Nothing was different. Even the curtains and the bedspread remained new only for a few days. The chameleon changed again. But the more it changed, the more it remained the same. The lack, the gap that reappeared every time it was filled, could be refilled continually only to reappear again. If this object failed to satisfy, surely the next object would succeed, or the next job transfer, or the next apartment. The next object was to be the largest of all our objects. It was Vesna's baby carriage a four-wheeled vehicle complete with bed and canopy, two axles, springs, and brakes. It was the only vehicle we ever owned. And it was from that vehicle that I learned the narcotic potency of the manufactured thing. We scrupulously examined every carriage in the city before deciding which one was to be our carriage. We wheeled it to our apartment as if it were made of glass, carefully avoiding every pool of dirty water, raising it gently over every bump. We carried it upstairs to our bedroom, and we continued to keep it in our bedroom, not so much because we were afraid it would be stolen from the hallway, but because we wanted it where we could see it. In other epics, people looked for gods, saints, and revelations to confirm their lost humanity. In ours, the commodity embodies all the gods, saints, and revelations. Whenever we were depressed by the hollowness of our lives, whenever we felt the still unfulfilled gap, we looked at Vesna's carriage. The object confirmed our purpose and our worth. It was the meaning of the endless waiting and the meaninglessness work. Our evening walks on the neighborhood streets, and especially our Sunday walks in the city park, became the high points of our lives. It was on those walks that we displayed our qualities, the qualities we had bought in stores. As soon as we had the carriage, we needed the clothes that went with it. I bought a suit identical to the suits I had seen in the city park, the suits of young men who accompanied their baby carriages and their wives. Myrna and Vesna each acquired a dress with similar properties. We were now complete. When we promenaded Vesna through the park, we felt ourselves admired the same way we had admired the well-dressed couples with baby carriages. Passers-by looked into our carriage and smiled at Vesna. We were proud of Vesna, proud of our success, proud to be admired. Vesna, Myrna, and I were like all the others in the park, like the admirable others, the members of the working class. We were complete human beings, citizens. Our clothes and Vesna's carriage proved it. At the end of the promenade, we removed our attributes and hung them in the closet always keeping them spotless and uncreased. We set Vesna's carriage in the corner of our room. It was a very pretty carriage. We still have it, but Vesna is no longer with us. Our bliss lasted for two seasons. I don't know how long we could have remained intoxicated by our objects if the ground under our feet hadn't shifted, but I suspect the drugs would have lost their power on their own during the third season. In any case, we weren't given a chance to enjoy the full effect of our narcotics. Our frail house of cards collapsed around us. The event that put an end to our blissful stupor was a violent encounter between Jan and the foreman at the depot where we worked. The foreman was the type of person usually described as dumb and ruthless. He was several years younger than we were and had started working at the depot three years before Jan was hired. He was immediately recruited as a police informer and he apparently did this job so well that he was appointed section foreman only a few months after he was hired and general foreman a few months after that. Although he had spent a few months working as a repair mechanic, by the time he was general foreman, he had become convinced that the mechanics were all mindless robots, and that the only thinking in the depot took place in his head. He thought of the rest of us not as complete human beings, but as human fragments, as extensions of his limbs, as instruments which mindlessly implemented his orders. The only consequence of the foreman's attitude was that his attentions were completely undermined. Since we were brainless, we didn't use our brains to implement his wishes, but only to thwart them. As extensions of his limbs, we were worse than lifeless limbs. We were rebellious implements that continually frustrated their user. No one expressed this rebelliousness as explicitly as Jan. Whenever the foreman called his name, Jan instantly dropped whatever he was holding, even if it was an oil pan, jumped up, saluted, and shouted, Yes, sir! Jan was the only one who tried to conform in every single detail to the way the foreman saw him. If all the foreman told him was, Pull that carburetor out. Jan took a winch or a pry bar and pulled the carburetor out without removing any of the bolts. One day, Jan was removing a rear wheel to replace a worn bearing. What the hell are you doing? All it needs is grease, the foreman shouted. Jan furiously replaced the wheel and packed it with grease. The bus was towed back to the depot two weeks later with a ruined axle and wheel. The rest of us also implemented the foreman's orders to the letter, but none of us were as scrupulous as Jan. If some buses were nevertheless repaired, it was only because the foreman couldn't be everywhere at the same time and all of us worked with relative efficiency when we weren't carrying out a command. Some weeks after the incident with the broken wheel, the foreman again pulled Jan off the job he was doing and bellowed, See if there's oil in this engine, and don't let me catch you doing anything to the engine. 
The foreman had conveniently forgotten that he'd been wrong when he'd kept Jan from replacing the wheel bearing. Jan did exactly what the foreman told him to, and two days later the bus returned with a burned-out engine. The foreman was furious. He ran to Jan and shouted, I thought, I thought I told you to see if there was oil in that engine. Jan dropped his tools and saluted, saying, Yes, sir! There couldn't have been a drop of oil in it, the foreman shouted. Yes, sir, Jan said. You imbecile, the foreman bellowed. I told you to put oil in. Did you put oil in that engine? No, sir, Jan answered. The foreman's eyes were red with fury. He le leered at the rest of us, ran to get a crowbar, and swung it at Jan's head. Jan ducked and was hit lightly on the shoulder. Jan picked up a wrench. The foreman started to swing his crowbar again, but I ran up from behind him and yanked the bar out of his grasp. You're lying, I told him, holding on to the bar. I heard what you told Jan to do. You told him to see if there was oil in the engine, and you explicitly told him not to do anything else. You're crazy, the foreman shouted. Who ever heard of sending a bus on the road with a dry engine? Everyone here has heard of that, I answered. We've also heard of sending a bus out with a worn bearing and of stopping someone who wanted to fix it. Backing away from me and the crowbar, the foreman shouted at the top of his voice, Put that bar down. You can't threaten me. You sedlacks are lunatics. I'll have you locked up. You're sick. Someone sent you here to wreck the workers' buses. Who pays you to wreck buses? Jan turned to the foreman and said calmly, No one pays us to do it. We wreck the buses on our own and for ourselves. We can't stand them. They use up our space, our air, and our energy. We're lunatics determined to drive you and your buses out of our asylum. I'm reminded of your scene with the school official who said you were deranged and dangerous when you called off your class to take part in the student strike. I commend you for your courage. You really do share that with Jan. Your courage was in fact greater because Jan and I weren't nearly as isolated as you were. The foreman backed away from us like a cornered beast. He grabbed another bar and then a wrench, but he didn't try to use them. He no longer faced only the two of us. Every single worker in the depot had picked up a tool and joined the semicircle of angry workers surrounding the foreman. Every single person was waiting for the foreman to take the slightest step towards Jan, toward me, toward any other worker. We were all waiting for him to start swinging his bar, his wrench, or even his fist. The foreman was pale with fright. He cringed away, hugging the wall, trembling, not taking his eyes off us for a second. 